Presented by Caltech. Hi everyone, uh, this is Wei Gao. I'm a system professor of medical engineering. So today I will mainly talk about uh, our research on making hardware, basically the device that can collect the data, wearable biosensors for continuous health monitoring. So as we know, wearables could play a very important role in personalized healthcare because they can continuously collect data from our body and tell us what's going on and what's going wrong with our health. But if you look at commercially available health monitors, like Apple Watch or Fitbit, so they can mainly track the physical activities or vital signs, but fail to provide more useful information about our health at the molecular level. So one major challenge, which is also we think is a great opportunity, is how can we collect the chemical or molecule information continuously and ideally non-invasively. So looking at this issue, we actually start to find the proper candidate for developing this wearable sensor. We are looking at human sweat, firstly. As you can see, sweat is a very important body fluid. We can retrieve sweat conveniently, non-invasively, and continuously. In fact, the sweat contains many important biomarkers or analytes, including electrolytes, metabolites, more than 30 amino acids, and more than 300 proteins. We can also find different kinds of like, substance, like heavy metals, drugs, and alcohols from our sweat. So in the past, in the clinical, actually, sweat tests has already been used for some applications, including disease diagnosis. So one classic example is using cystic fibrosis diagnosis. It's a genetic lung disease. The diagnosis of CF is based on sweat chloride concentration. Sweat tests can also be used for other applications, including doping control, drug dosage control, genomic studies, and fitness monitoring. But still, many people don't know application about sweat, the detailed application. One major issue causes this because in the past, the sweat test cannot provide real-time information. And they usually require the bulky instrument, for them LCMS. How people collect sweat in the past? You know, they put a patch on the skin, then collect like several hours or even 24 hours or several days to get one point. Then they send out this sample for a laboratory test to get one value. As you can imagine, we cannot get detailed or even actual information from average data over time because many analyte level in our body or in our sweat very rapidly. To, one could imagine that if we can design a wearable sweat patch, we can apply this onto the skin and collect the molecular information continuously. We could use this information for track our fitness level, and we could use this for disease diagnosis or health monitoring. And very importantly, actually, in line with today's workshop, we can get a large set of data from our daily activities. So this large set of data combined with the machine learning, big data analysis, can enable numerous fundamental and clinical investigations. So in 2016, I developed the first prototype, uh, first generation of our wearable sweat sensor. It is more like a flexible sweat band. As you can see, the whole system is flexible. You can wear this at wrist, arm, or forehead. This system can perform the on-site conditioning and processing. They can analyze, you know, multiple sweat analytes, including glucose, lactate, sodium, potassium, and skin temperature. Basically, we build the whole system, and we can wirelessly receive the data from the cell phone. We can in the end upload the data to the cloud. So this wearable sensor consists of two major parts. The left side is a flexible, disposable sensor patch. It can be prepared in large scale and low cost. The right side is a reusable, flexible patch. It's more like uh, the hardware side. You can, you can reuse this side and uh, replace the sensor patch every day or even every several hours, depending on the sensor reliability. Very low cost in this case. You can just change this within a few seconds. In the first generation, we designed these five different sensors in our platform, including glucose, lactate, sodium, potassium, and skin temperature. We choose this because we think they are important for our health. As you know, Glucose 
is a very important target for diabetes management. Uh, right now, it's very important to monitor like pre-diabetes or um, other metabolic syndrome. So sweat glucose is reported to be related with our blood glucose level. And lactate is informative for our fitness condition. And sodium, potassium, they are more like telling us about the hydration levels. And skin temperature is also very informative for many skin-related diseases. And very importantly, this skin temperature can be used for calibrating other sensor reading. So basically, in case of the glucose and lactate sensor, we are using classic enzymatic electrodes. We are using glucose oxidase and lactate oxidase, this kind of enzyme, to ensure the sensor have good selectivity. So we actually engineer the sensor. We are using Prussian blue as a mediator that can lower the operation potential of this kind of enzymatic sensor to zero volt. Basically, you don't even need to apply a high voltage. Basically, around zero volt, it can operate. You can marry the current between the working electrode and the reference counter electrode. Basically, the measure the current level is linear with the glucose or lactate concentration in the body fluid. And this kind of like Prussian blue, the thickness is also very important. If you pick a very thin Prussian blue, you get a very high sensitivity. This is suitable for glucose sensor because glucose concentration in sweat is roughly 100 times lower than blood. But for lactate, it's the opposite. Lactate in sweat is much higher than our blood. You need a much wider linear range. That's why we pick a very thick Prussian blue film. Basically, we are also using carbonyl tube to increase the sensitivity to make sure we can detect the trace level glucose from our sweat. In case of the sodium and potassium sensors, they are based on ion selective electrodes. So basically, you coat the working electrode with a polymeric film which contains a chemical we call ionophores. For each ion, we have a specific chemical that can recognize these ions. The working principle is like this, like a metal ion, for example, a potassium ion for volinomycin. This chemical has a ring structure. The ring structure has a very similar size with the potassium ions. When you put the sensor into a solution containing potassium, you know, potassium will go inside this ring and set the voltage of this working electrode. You are essentially monitoring the voltage difference between the working electrode and the reference electrode. Uh, according to this equation, the voltage difference is linear to the logarithm concentration of the ion concentration. In this case, the slope is 59.16 millivolt per decade of concentration. Note, this is for sodium and potassium. The charge of ion is equal to one. If you are measuring calcium, for example, Z equal to two in this case, and your sensor slope is 29.6 millivolt per decade of concentration. Here I want to say, not only working electrode is very important, this type of reference electrode is also very important. Because you are measuring voltage difference, you want your reference electrode to become very stable. So if you just use silver silver chloride, it's a classic reference electrode in a solid state, the potential of this reference electrode will fluctuate with the solution chloride concentration. Because this reference electrode is also essentially a chloride selective electrode. To address this problem, we coated this reference electrode with a polymeric film which contains saturated sodium chloride to ensure we have good uh, like, uh, protection from chloride concentration, uh, chloride ions, because this act as a buffer film. Because no matter how external chloride or ion change, the voltage of this reference electrode will remain stable because of a stable sodium chloride concentration inside this polymer film. So, all the sensors will go through different circuit paths, and all the data will be processed in a microcontroller and send to the uh, cell phone through Bluetooth. And we develop this Android cell phone app. You can real time check the analyzer concentration and their progression profile. And this kind of sensor can be prepared using micro nanofabrication process, like uh, same film evaporation and photolithography. And then we are using Perlin C as the insulation layer to avoid the metal skin contact. We can modify each electrode in the end. This is the one sensor array with five sensors. And right now, we can use the larger scale printing technology, which can dramatically lower the cost of this kind of sensor array. So as you can see, if you vary one analyte concentration, the response of other sensors remains stable. That means that the sensor have good selectivity. But this is under one condition. It's the same solution with all the sensors. Under one condition, the temperature is fixed. What if the temperature changes? 
as you can see here, actually when temperature rises from 22 degrees C to 37 degrees C, your glucose and lactate sensor response increased by 70%. That means if you don't do any calibration, you will have a huge error from your sensors while you do on body. Uh, our body temperature is different from our skin temperature because this skin temperature can vary a lot. Some of my students actually in a cold temperature, their skin temperature can be like 14 degrees C. Typically a guy, for example, like me, 35 degrees C is a very big difference, a 20 degree difference. That's a huge error if you don't do calibration. With a temperature sensor in the system, we can do the real time calibration, get accurate reading from our body. And you can package the sensor into a different form and to perform simultaneous uh, data collection. You know, during exercise, you can see the cell phone in the, uh, app interface. You can display all the values of each analyte and check the dynamic profile. You can in the end save the data to the cloud or send it to the computer through email. So I want to say, uh, like I be in the beginning I mentioned, this type of big data collection, right now it's not very big, but you can imagine if you track over a long time, you can get a very large set of data. It's very useful for many applications. Basically, in the following slides, I will mention with, uh, some of the potential applications using our wearable sensor. So the first one is dehydration monitoring in sport medicine. As you know, if you do long-term exercise, uh, like a marathon, actually, you will dehydrate it very quickly over time. It's very important to monitor dehydration status because it could be very dangerous. Uh, it is also very important for patients. You know, many clinicians told me their patients, especially for the elderly patients, when they stay at home or stay at the hospital, they don't even realize they are very dehydrated, which is a very dangerous condition for them. In this case, using our sensor, we can track potentially the dehydration status by monitoring the sodium concentration in our sweat. As you can see, these are two groups of subjects. The first group will ask the basically, consent every five minutes drink water continuously. And the second group were not allowed to drink any water. As you can see, sodium level dramatically increased in the group of subjects who were not allowed to drink any water during exercise. This is a clear indication so sodium can potentially be a biomarker for dehydration monitoring. Another application is the kidney function monitoring. You know, calcium is a very important biomarker for kidney. Basically, for the people with the kidney failure, their calcium concentration in sweat is twice as high as a healthy subject. If you're monitoring the free calcium ions using ion selective electrode, you cannot get a full picture of your calcium level because the calcium ion is depending on the pH concentration. In this case, we can develop this sensor array that can simultaneously monitor calcium and the pH over time, and we calibrate the sensor reading with you know, the commercial pH meter and the ICPMS analysis. We we'll get a very accurate reading from data activity in this case. So another application is the heavy metal analysis. You know, we are exposed to heavy metal every day through our food or drinking water. The heavy metal contamination has already caused the children's health problem in recent water crisis in Michigan Flint, you know, because of the later contamination in water. One could imagine that if you can monitor this your heavy metal from your body, you can get an idea about your daily activity or daily exposure to the heavy metal. Because sweat is a very important way for our body to detoxify, to basically get rid of the heavy metals. From by monitor sweat heavy metal, you know your daily exposure in this case. Monitor heavy metal requires different uh, sensing technology because the concentration is pretty low. In this case, we are using a microelectrode array. Because the concentration is so low, you need to pre-concentrate the target. Basically, by applying a very low voltage, these heavy metal ions will be deposited onto this microelectrode array. We call it pre-concentration or deposition, like a take a minute, this process. Then you can sweep the voltage from low to high. Then the heavy metal film on your electrode will be oxidized at different voltage. By monitor the current at certain voltage, you know certain heavy metal concentration. In this case, as you can see, we use a gold electrode, we, use, we can monitor lead, copper, and mercury. Using bismuth electrode, we can monitor zinc, Cadmium and the lead. Why we need both? Because gold electrode doesn't have good performance at a very low voltage, cannot be used to detect the zinc. So we actually can monitor this kind of heavy metal, five heavy metal simultaneously from our body, and we validated the sensor using 
I see PMS. Till now, maybe some people will have questions. Since you are monitor sweat, so what if I don't sweat? <laughs> How, I mean, will your sensor be still useful? You know, that's a very important question we have to answer. Otherwise, we cannot apply this technology on everyone, especially on the patient, right? So by looking at the literature, uh, we found that there is a way you can locally induce sweat, a process called antiphoresis. In a clinical setting, the clinicians apply this process basically to locally draw the sweat from the patient. Basically, this is a classic way used for cystic fibrosis diagnosis. By applying a constant current, a DC current from your skin, the positively charged drug molecule, like pyrocarbon, will go below your skin and stimulate the sweat gland. Basically, you will get a sweat from this small area, only from this small area. Inspired by this process, we develop a newer platform, newer generation of our sensor that can locally induce sweat and perform sweat sensing. In this case, you don't have to do any exercise. You can just do your computer work in your homework, for example. You can still analyze your sweat. So in collaboration with the Stanford School of Medicine, especially Cystic Fibrous Center, we applied, we actually studied how the induced sweat process look like. Can we control this process? As you can see from here, by using different type of drugs or different drug dosage, you can basically control several parameters of this sweat induction process. As you can see from one parameter, response latency. It tells you how long sweat will come out if you do anaphoresis, if you apply the current. So look at the red one here. Pyrocarbon, it takes 240 seconds for sweat to come out if you apply anaphoresis. Apply current first, then four minutes after that, sweat come out. But if you use acetylcholine here, 52 seconds, that means less than one minute, sweat will come out if you apply anaphoresis. So this is pretty rapid. By control the drug amount and drug types, we can control the parameters of this sweating process. And you could periodically induce sweat, not only for one time use, right? For this platform, when you want to do analysis, you can just click a button from your cell phone, and this sweat generation process will start. If you apply 10 second current, you don't have to all the time apply current. You apply 10 second, sweat will come out continuously for 15 minutes. So if you apply for five minutes, the sweating process can last for one hour nearly. And if you use different drug, this process can be longer for several hours even. Just apply a few minutes current. You can get continuously only from this small area for several hours. Uh, whenever you want to do this analysis again, you just control from your cell phone. So this type of platform basically is very promising for clinical application, as you can imagine, because we can apply this on the patient. So some potential applications, I want to mention a few examples. Firstly, non-invasive glucose monitoring. You know, this is a very big topic everybody cares about. But the main question is, does sweat glucose reflect your blood glucose level? So we did some pilot study, and by monitoring fasting glucose level in sweat and fasting glucose level in blood compared to after certain glucose intake, we found a kind of good correlation between sweat and blood glucose level. Still a controversial topic, people, a lot of people working in this uh, field and try to build a better correlation because it does require more calibration mechanism to get the best correlation, basic algorithm to, uh, that's suitable for everyone in this case. The second application is just classic application as I mentioned before, cystic fibrosis diagnosis. This is the health condition, lung disease, a genetic lung disease has closure, uh, that can influence people's health. The patient usually die at a very young age, like before age of 40. So clinically, people do safe diagnosis based on chloride on the infants, basically. And you can imagine, this anaphoresis works for all the, all the infants. It's pretty safe for the adults in this case. We apply this on the healthy subject and on the patient. And you can see, from our sensor, you can clearly see the difference of the sodium chloride level from a healthy subject compared to those from patients. Look at the statistic value. Considering the gold standard for diagnosis based on chloride, more than 40 millimolar, we can say this device can be used for screening and diagnosing CF. 
very rapidly actually, in like 10, 20 minutes. In the clinical setting, people, you know, the doctors collect sweat for like one hour, then send out to a laboratory, take a week to get data. Now we can do very fast. So the third application is drug monitoring. In personalized and precision medicine, this is the one very important topic, as you can imagine. The clinician or the physician really want to tailor the dose according to each patient, because each patient responds differently to drugs. Um, for the elderly patient, young patient, or fatty patient, or senior you know, patient, different people respond differently. And the met metabolic rate can vary significantly. But right now, there is no such mechanism to monitor your drug level in your body. The gold standard for monitoring drug is based on LCMS. You collect uh, blood with your you know, hospital visit to collect a large set of blood drop, a blood uh, like sample. Then they uh, go send out to lab for the laboratory analysis. We take another several days to get a one point reading. They don't get the real time information of your drug level in your body, as you can imagine. So, this is, uh, there is a high demand for this technology. So, we are evaluating also the use of our wearable sensor for drug monitoring. Initially, we started with a very simple drug that everyone could take every day, caffeine. Basically, by asking the student to drink coffee, you basically doping the subject, right? You drink one shot of coffee, two shot of coffee, or three shot of coffee. You can monitor the uh, co caffeine concentration in your sweat. So uh, surprisingly, we found that if you give a subject different those kind of uh, coffee, you can get a linear response from your sweat concentration. And when you track this thing over time, after you drink coffee, your body caffeine level increase in the first hour and reach peak at around 60 minutes. That means one hour after you drink coffee, probably you feel the best. <laughs> then after one hour, it starts to decay. This is the, the pilot project on caffeine. Right now, we are collaborating with the City of Hope on monitoring cancer drugs. We have recruited many patients already. And uh, one of the uh, things I want to mention, when we recruit a patient, of those patients who offer to the, for the participation, 75% cancer patients said yes. That means that for them, this technology is very important. And this sweat test is also very important because some people might say, why not monitor saliva? It's easy, it's easy to get saliva also. But in fact, it's not that easy for many patients. It's hard for them to provide saliva. And most of the time, the patient could sleep, you know, sleep there because they take many medications. But sweat technology is very promising because a nurse can really let's go wear this device on the patient and do this sweat induction sensing. As long as with the patient consent, you know, they could do even while they are sleeping. So this is a very promising this, uh, aspect. So, well, one important issue I want to mention is uh, some people may have a question, I think I've got asked many times, how fast you sweat? Will this sweat rate affect your concentration of your sweat analyte? The answer is, could be. It, 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 for some markers, no matter how fast you sweat, your sweat concentration doesn't really change much. It always correlates very well with your blood. But for some markers, if you sweat faster, like sodium, your sodium level in sweat will be higher. Basically, introducing a sweat rate sensor is very important in this case for potential calibration. And another issue is if you do the wearable sensor, how you know, sweat evaporation, contamination, or, or sweat buildup influence your sensor performance. In this case, microfluidic is very important to minim miniaturize the influence from the evaporation and the skin contamination. To this, uh, in this regard, we build this kind of microfluidic sensor page that could perform efficient sweat sampling and the sweat rate monitoring. Monitor, to monitor sweat rate, we are measuring the impedance between a two parallel gold electrode. When sweat, more sweat come inside, you know, the impedance between the electrode will change. By monitoring impedance, we know the sweat rate concentration. In this case, we could do more calibration to get a more accurate correlation. So the last slide on the technical part is how to make this thing cheaper. Because we are targeting the consumer use, right? We want this device can be used for everyone. Then cost will be very important. We could actually make this kind of sensor patch very large scale and low cost. As you can see, this is a row-to-row -row printing. You can print 
hundreds of meters of these kind of sensors, basically millions of sensors in one row, like printing newspapers. Very low cost in this case. They still have very good performance. To summarize, uh, we have developed this platform. Ap uh, we can apply this wearable sweat sensor to monitor our metabolites, electrolytes, and right now at Caltech, we are doing a lot more biomarkers from our sweat. And we do have a paper um, coming probably in December in Nature Biotech um, monitors sweat analyte as well. Uh, we could combine this kind of molecular sensing with vital sign sensors. And in, in this, and, uh, you basically get a multimodal data, physical, chemical data together. By bringing all these kind of data, when we couple this data with machine learning or data analysis, we could use this kind of data to study a lot of questions, clinical fundamental problems. Right now, we are collaborating with uh, several major medical centers around LA, around California, basically. And we are hoping this technology could play an important role in future personalized healthcare. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so right now we, we didn't work on, we, I, we haven't worked on the genomic studies because, you know, they are relatively larger molecules. So sweat, uh, especially we are developing this wearable sensor, one important criteria we choose which kind of target we want to develop is that this sensor can perform continuous monitoring. Classic protein uh, or, or like a DNA sensors, you know, they are based on either based on the large uh, laboratory test, based uh, you know like LCMS, for example, or based on antibodies. You know, for antibody-based sensor is very hard to regenerate. They could be used for one time, but not very good for continuous use. But right now we do have a nice approach which could uh, allow us to do continuous monitoring with those markers. But we haven't applied the technology to DNA yet, I think. Yeah. So um, you, you mentioned that in many of these applications, data is it's not a big data problem yet. It's, mm -hmm. it, but it, you anticipate it will be a big data problem soon. Yes. Where do you think are, you know, a year from now, are the best opportunities for machine learning in this area? I think, uh, like, uh, Right now, I think one important topic, uh, very important, we think is the cardiometabolic monitoring. For example, like, uh, when you, uh, it's very important for public health to monitor this kind of metabolites over time along with the vital signs to see the people, like, uh, to compare the people with healthy people, obesity people, and pre-diabetic people, and diabetic people to see the difference. And then we can, it's essentially, I mean, eventually we hope to be able to predict the insulin resistance and before people develop the pre-diabetes or diabetes in this case. Just one example. So, that requires collecting data from a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> Are there any applications where you can do analysis from longitudinal studies of these patients? So uh, one important application is pharmacokinetics. That's like a, the drug level continuously in the same patient over time. Then because we want to build that model according to each patient, because each patient responds different to each drug. Yeah, that's a promising application, I think. Yeah. 